Welcome. The program today is on the topic of honesty. If you will, turn to your Bibles to Ephesians 4 and Colossians 3. We'll be looking at those passages briefly in just a little while. There are people today who say that you can have faith and believe what you want as long as doing so does not influence what you do in your work. What good would your religion be if it had no influence on your conversation or your conduct? James said in James 1, 26 and 27, if anyone among you thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his own heart, this one's religion is useless. Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their troubles and to keep themselves unspotted from the world. According to the disciple James in James 1, 26 to 27, that a religion which does not influence the person to watch their tongue and to watch their walk of life, their conduct, their conversation, is a useless religion. The religion of Christ urges people not only to hear the word and believe, but also to obey the word. So many today are saying something similar to what we, we said earlier. You can have faith and you can believe whatever you want as long as it doesn't influence what you do or influence your work, your job. Does our religion influence our work, our job? It ought to. It ought to influence the way that we live, the way that we speak, the way that we conduct ourselves. In the Bible, lying is condemned, with deceit being contrasted with speaking the truth. Christians are instructed to be examples of good works and to speak with integrity of heart. Paul wrote Titus in chapter 2, 6 to 8, Likewise, exhort the young men to be sober-minded in all things, showing yourselves to be a pattern of good works, in doctrine showing integrity reverence, incorruptibility, sound speech that cannot be condemned, that one who is an opponent may be ashamed, having nothing evil to say of you. Can you imagine living such a life, a life of integrity, reverence, and incorruptibility, of having such conduct and such speech, which is sound, that it cannot be condemned rightly, that someone who may be your opponent ought to feel ashamed when they try to say something about you, having nothing evil at all to say. And so Paul is urging Titus to teach the brethren that they be examples. In this case, particularly the young men, but it would apply to others as well. The young men in teaching the word of God, but others in living according to that word as well. In doctrine showing integrity, reverence, incorruptibility. The Apostle Paul wrote letters to the churches of Christ at Ephesus and Colossae, and in both letters to his brethren, he described living a new life in Christ. The former conduct he described as the old man, and the present life he described as the new man. You've heard about being born again. Jesus said in John 3, you must be born again. Verse 3, verse 5, born of water and the Spirit. And so you live, you begin to live a new life in Christ. You who believe and obey his gospel. Take a look at passages, Ephesians 4, 17 to 24, and also Colossians 3, 1 to 7. Ephesians 4 and verse 17. The Apostle Paul wrote, this I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God 
because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart, who, being past feeling, have given themselves over to lewdness, to work all uncleanness with, un with greediness. He says, but you have not so learned Christ. If indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning your former conduct the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. And also in Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 to 7, he says, if you then were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. For you died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Therefore put to death your members which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming on the sons of disobedience, in which you yourselves once walked when you lived in them. And so in these passages, Paul speaks of the old man contrasted with the new man. Since as Christians, we are living a new life in Christ, we ought to follow the teachings of Christ as revealed in the New Testament. Put on the things of righteousness and put away the things of sin. Consider the following passages in Ephesians 4.25 and Colossians 3 and 9. He says, but you, but now you yourselves are to put off all these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. Do not lie to one another, since you have put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. And so underlined is do not lie to one another. And this is the point that I want to emphasize. He mentioned the old life, that old life of sin, that old man of sin. And now this new life, this new man of righteousness. Do not lie to one another. Since you are this new man in Christ, do not lie to one another. Ephesians 4 and 25. Therefore, that is because you are a new man in Christ, put away lying. Let each of you speak truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another, men, women, all members of the body of Christ. Speak the truth, put away lying. And so in Colossians and Ephesians, he wrote this similar message to both congregations of the Lord's church. Some background on the passage. In Zechariah 8, 16 to 17, the words of Paul that Paul wrote by inspiration, let each one of you speak truth with his neighbor. These words sound similar to what we see in the Old Testament, to what the Lord spoke to the house of Judah through the prophet Zechariah. In Zechariah 8, 16 to 17, he says, these are the things you shall do. Speak each man the truth to his neighbor. Give judgment in your gates for truth, justice, and peace. Let none of you think evil in your heart against your neighbor, and do not love a false oath. For all these things I hate, says the Lord. And so we see that the Lord hates the false oath. He hates those who would have evil, the evil thoughts in their hearts, the, that they would have evil against their neighbor. Instead, he loves truth and justice and peace. And so he begins by saying, speak each man the truth to his neighbor. And so Paul, the apostle in the New Testament, let each of you, each one of you, speak truth with his neighbor. For this sermon, we will consider the following three points. First, lying is contrary to the Lord. Jesus said to the heavenly Father in prayer, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. The apostle Paul, who was called by Jesus, wrote, in hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised before time began, but has in due time manifested his word 
through preaching, Titus 1, 2 to 3. Remember that, God who cannot lie. There's great assurance in the promise of God, given the facts of his immutable, unchangeable counsel and his immutable oath, since he cannot lie. Hebrews 6, 17 to 18, it says, Thus God, determining to show more abundantly to the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath, that by two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation, who have fled for refuge to lay ho hold of the hope set before us. Note here, not only can God not lie, but it is impossible for God to lie. Back to the Old Testament, book of Proverbs. Proverbs 6, 16 to 19, Solomon wrote, These six things the Lord hates, yes, seven are an abomination to him. A proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises e wicked plans, feet that are swift to running to evil, a false witness who speaks lies, and one who sows discord among the brethren. Note in this passage two of the seven a lying tongue, and a false witness who speaks lies. The Lord hates sin. Consider that when Solomon listed these seven things, two of the seven dealt with the sin of dishonesty. The lying tongue deceives with ill intent. The false witness who speaks lies is guilty of perjury or false swearing under oath. And so the idea here of a lying tongue or a false witness who speaks lies these are all things that God hates. And so these seven things are not an exhaustive list, but give the whole that God hates sin, as we ought to hate sin. The word of God is the word of truth. According to the psalmist in Psalm 119, 159, he said, Consider how I love your precepts. Revive me, O Lord, according to your loving kindness. The entirety of your word is truth and every one of your righteous judgments endures forever. The entirety of your word is truth, the psalmist said. When you consider Psalm 119 and how this is the longest of the psalms, how almost every one of the verses deals in some way or another with the word of God. The entirety of your word is truth, he said. We want to know that lying is contrary to the very nature of the Lord. Second, lying is prohibited by the law, the law of Moses. The Jews were given the law of Moses, and we see that the law said in Exodus 20 and 16, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. And so here we see number nine of the Ten Commandments, also repeated in Deuteronomy 5 and verse 20. And you shall not swear by my name falsely, nor shall you profane the name of your God. I am the Lord. Leviticus 19 and 12. The law of Moses was against perjury, the practice of false swearing. In the New Testament, Jesus told a Jewish man who came to him, and it's implied that he was a Jewish man because Jesus told him to, to keep the commandments of the Law of Moses. Mark 10, 19, you know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and your mother. In each one of these examples, we see that these are also condemned under the new covenant. Besides forbidding false witness, Exodus 20 and verse 16, we see that the law forbid defrauding one another. Leviticus 19 and 13, you shall not cheat or you shall not defraud your neighbor nor rob him. Of course, robbing, stealing, do not steal was one of the Ten Commandments as well. In the New Testament, Paul wrote to Timothy in 1 Timothy 1 and 10, the law is, and then he mentions various transgressors, for liars and for perjurers. Back to the Old Testament in the book of Proverbs, Solomon wrote in Proverbs 12, 17 to 20, he who speaks truth declares righteousness, but a false witness deceit. 
There is one who speaks like the piercing of a sword, but the tongue of the wise promotes health. The truthful lip shall be established forever, but a lying tongue is but for a moment. Deceit is in the heart of those who devise evil, but counselors of peace have joy. The disciples of Jesus had heard in Matthew 5 and 33, according to Jesus, you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform your oaths to the Lord. There were those Pharisees of the religion of the Jews who would swear, but would afterwards dismiss their oaths as nothing, as if not obliged to perform it, saying that they swore a certain way, and so they were not. They were not obliged. They were not required to keep it. Matthew chapter 23, 16 to 22, if you will, turn for a moment to that passage. This helps us better to understand Matthew 5, 33. Matthew 23 and verse 16, Jesus pronounced woe upon the Pharisees who were hypocrites. He says, woe to you scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. For you travel the land and sea to win one proselyte, and when he is one, you make him twice as much a son of hell as yourselves. Woe to you, blind guides, who say, whoever swears by the temple, it is nothing. But whoever swears by the gold of the temple, he is obliged to perform it. Fools and blind, for which is greater, the gold or the temple that sanctifies the gold? And whoever swears by the altar, it is nothing. But whoever swears by the gift that is on it, he is obliged to perform it. Fools and blind, for which is greater, the gift or the altar that sanctifies the gift? Therefore, he who swears by the altar swears by it and by all things on it. He who swears by the temple swears by it and by him who dwells in it. And he who swears by heaven swears by the throne of God and by him who sits on it. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. Note from the passage how that they would swear, such as they would swear by the gold, that is the gold of the temple, or they would swear by the altar. They might say, well, that didn't really matter, didn't really mean anything. If I would have said that I swore by the, the altar, that is, if I was to swear by the gift that was on the altar, then I would be obliged to keep it. And so you see the, the links to which they would go to, to disavow themselves of the vow that they, that they made. And so Jesus taught against such hypocrisy and such deceit. And with the Pharisees, most likely in mind, in verse 20, we see that with their hypocrisy, like we saw in Matthew 6, 2 and 5 and 16, Jesus taught his disciples in Matthew 5, 34, but I say to you, do not swear at all. Remember the Pharisees are swearing oaths and then they're finding ways to try to disavow themselves of the oath. But Jesus says, do not swear at all, neither by heaven for it is God's throne, nor by the earth for it is his footstool, nor by Jerusalem for it is the city of the great king nor shall you swear by your head because you cannot make one hair white or black, but let your yes be yes and your no, yo, no, for whatever is more than these is from the evil one. Regrettably, some of which the Pharisees said was from the evil one. Those who would make vows and not keep their vows, uh, finding ways to excuse themselves, and so Jesus is teaching his people to be people of their word, people of honesty, not, a, not excuse makers. The disciple James in the New Testament taught his disciples, his, well, his fellow Christians, patience, and he taught them perseverance in James 5, 7 to 11. And he also taught them to trust the Lord with judgment. James 5 and 12, he says, but above all, my brethren, do not swear either by heaven or by the earth, or with any other oath, but let your yes be yes, and let your no, no, lest you fall into judgment. And so there were Christians who were persecuted. He urged to, to endure with patience and perseverance, and rather than to seek vengeance themselves, leave vengeance to God, trust the Lord with judgment, 
lest they themselves would fall into judgment and be condemned. We want to note again that lying was prohibited by the law of Moses for the Jews. It's also prohibited for us today as Christians, uh, whether we're Jews or Gentiles, all who are in Christ are called to honesty. Jesus taught honesty, removing any excuses for bearing false witness or swearing falsely, false oaths. Number three, lying is unfitting fitting for Christians. According to Paul in Romans 1.29, Paul describes some things which were not fitting. These included being full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and evil-mindedness. And so being full of deceit or deceitfulness is certainly not fitting for Christians, those who profess Christ and follow him. Peter taught that Christ died for us. There's the gospel. He died for our sins. And so Peter taught that Jesus who suffered for us, who suffered wrongfully and endured patiently, left us an example to follow. He quotes from the scriptures, presumably Isaiah 53 and 9, where he says, who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth. And so Jesus did not do any violence. Jesus did not commit any sin. Jesus did not have guile or deceit in his mouth. He did not lie or deceive others, but was honest. And so he's left us an example, one, to be, to endure, to endure patiently, even if suffering wrongfully. Of course, also remembering why Jesus suffered. He suffered for us. Peter also quoted the psalmist David in Psalm 34, 12 to 13, saying, He who would love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. The apostle taught in 1 Peter 2, 1 to 3, Therefore, laying aside all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and all evil speaking, as newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word, that you may grow thereby if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. And so I've underlined all deceit. And so as Christians, lay aside all deceit. Be people of honesty. The brethren in the first century wanted to be characterized by their honesty and integrity as Christians. For example, in Hebrews 13, 18, pray for us, for we are confident that we have a good conscience in all things desiring to live honorably, honestly, with integrity. Lying is unfitting for Christians, and honesty is only appropriate. What do we conclude from these three points? We learn that God hates the lying tongue and the one who would bear false witness the false witness itself. And while it is impossible for God himself to lie, and so he cannot lie, regrettably, men often do lie in sin. Ephesians 4 and 20, but you have not so learned Christ. If indeed you have heard him and been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus. And so if you have truly learned his lessons, then you, have, you would have learned honesty. Christians are taught in Colossians 3 and 9, do not lie to one another. And in Ephesians 4 and 25, to speak the truth with his neighbor. As members of the body of Christ, as Christians, we are called to speak the truth in love. The Apostle Paul wrote to the church at Ephesus, Ephesians 4, 14 to 16, he said that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. That may be the way that the world lives. That may be that the way that some uh, people professing truth may live. But he said, you be different. He said, speaking the truth in lie, love. He says, by doing so, you may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ. 
from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what by what every joint supplies according to the effective working by which every part does its share causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love speaking the truth in love and by so doing we see that the lord will cause the growth of the body of itself in love we hope that you have been blessed by the lesson today and that you would continue to study on your own you might ask the question, how does one become a Christian? How does one enter into the body of Christ? We note from Acts 2 that the Lord adds to the church daily, such as are being saved. Those who will believe Christ, who will believe the gospel of Christ, that Jesus died for our sins, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God repent of their sins, confess their faith in him, be baptized for remission of their sins. The Lord adds to the church. Acts 2, 32, Acts 2 and 38, repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for remission of your sins. Before we leave today, we want to remind you that it was Jesus who said, he who believes and is baptized shall be saved. Mark 16, 16. Until next time, we wish you the best as you continue to follow Christ. Thank you for coming.